Thank you for coming to the 15th session of Discussion Club of Russian National Library. The topic for discussion is considered to be quite simple – dictatorship of proletariat, democracy and power of people. I think there is no necessity to mention to the audience present here that the USSR was a special historical type of state. Its historical mission wasn't ultimately fulfilled. Yet it doesn't mean it should remain like that. It will be fulfilled within long decades to come, maybe within years to come. The mankind will have to solve the dilemma whether it should evolve as humanity or stay who we are now. I will not give other strict definitions of what we are today. The mankind will have to make a choice of its world outlook. Peoples of Russia made the first effort to do that. In many ways this effort turned out to be successful, but not in everything. The transformations that our country had to undergo were accompanied with some mistakes. What political mistakes were made by our state that didn't let our country, as well as other countries that belonged to socialistic bloc, to evolve as socialist states? This topic that makes part of political philosophy will be discussed between the doctor of economical science Mikhail Vasilievich Popov and professor of Moscow State University Alexander Vladimirovich Buzgalin. Each one of the speakers has got a long list of social responsibilities they are to meet, though we aren't going to speak about that today. Before this discussion takes place and we all take part in it, I'd like to say a few words about rules that need to be observed. The total duration of the discussion is two hours and a half. The discussion will consist of four rounds. The first round will include a speech by Mikhail Vasilievich and a speech by Alexander Vladimirovich. Both speeches should be no longer than 20 minutes. Then questions will be asked, each speaker will get three minutes. The second round will consist of answers of Mikhail Vasilievich and Alexander Vladimirovich. The third round will include speeches by seconds, if there are any. Dear colleagues, let me remind you once more that we are within walls of Russian National Library. This is a research institution with academic status. Therefore, all speeches, however emotional or radical they are, should be strictly academic. Otherwise, I'll be forced to interrupt speakers. This would have no precedent in Plekhanov's house. We have never had to interrupt anybody. Nevertheless, I need to warn you in advance. Uh, 
Another request to our speakers, to Mikhail Vasilievich and to Alexander Vladimirovich. I hope our listeners will agree with this. Let our speakers give definitions to the terms they are going to use in their speeches. What is socialism, what is dictatorship, etc. Who is going to be the first? Bosgalin Alexander Vladimirovich, I have prepared a small presentation with my definitions. How should I switch it on? How could I swap slides? A voice from the audience. We need to post there. Bosgalin Alexander Vladimirovich, please could you shift the screen a bit so that I could see it too? And there should be a small excerpt from our speeches, speech by Mikhail Vasilievich Popov and speech by Bosgalin. I promise you it will be included into 20 minutes time limit of my speech. Popov Mikhail Vasilievich, my speech to overlap your time limit sounds good to me. Bosgalin Alexander Vladimirovich, two minutes for you, three minutes for me within my time frame. Popov Mikhail Vasilievich, this is some bounty. Bosgalin, let me make it this way. In the first round, Bosgalin starts and Popov has the last word. In the last tour, Popov starts and Bosgalin has the last word. Popov, I don't object. Presenter, the last word will be after Plekhanov's house. Bosgalin, all right, let it be on after Plekhanov's house. In this video, you will see and hear Mikhail Vasilievich Popov. He turns on the presentation according to the video link given in the text. Popov is saying in the video, Buzgalin and his crony Kalganov, who is more scrupulous than Buzgalin, they drifted to so-called upgraded Marxism, that means pseudo-Marxism which is free from its core, the dictator, which is free from the dictatorship of proletariat. Have you ever heard Buzgalin speak for the dictatorship of proletariat? No. Marx did speak for dictatorship of proletariat. Taking such position means to be adversary to dictatorship of proletariat. Busgalin. This speech by Mikhail Vasilievich Popov was given in 2016. Now let me present you a video shot two months before Popov's speech who accused me of neglecting the dictatorship of proletariat. This is radio program of Komsomolskaya Pravda, video recorded by Mikhail Golovkin from Krasnaya TV. Record of Busgalin is running. Alexander Busgalin in the studio. The program Marx is Alive is dedicated today to a difficult and painful subject that prolongs the discussion started a week ago. But today we will pose our question more strictly. Today we are going to talk about the dictatorship of proletariat, not just about proletariat and class struggle. You might not believe it, but Marxism isn't integral without these words. Once Karl Marx highlighted that without coming to conclusion of dictatorship of proletariat, we will remain within limits of bourgeois small talk. I will let myself to quote from Karl Marx, then we will continue our discussion. It is well known that dictatorship of proletariat wasn't just a term for Karl Marx, this was cornerstone of Marx's theory. Let's make it out. Quotation. Between capitalist and communist society there lies a period of revolutionary transformation of the former into the latter. This period is accompanied by political transformation period and the state during this transformation period cannot be any other than revolutionary dictatorship of proletariat from critique of the Gotha program. And in addition to this, the first step of the revolution of workers will be turning of proletariat into dominant class, conquest of democracy. The proletariat will use its political dominance to seize the capital step by step from bourgeoisie to concentrate the implements of production within governmental power. 
That means proletariat organized as ruling class and to multiply the total sum of production forces as soon as possible. From Manifesto of Communist Party. These, these, these statements are quite strict. Lenin is even more strict and concise. Quoting Lenin. Bourgeois democracy is certainly quite valuable for bringing up the proletariat, for educating it. Let me say it once again, certainly quite valuable. I continue the quotation from Lenin. This democracy is always narrow-minded, hypocritical, spurious. It will always remain democracy for the rich, deception of the poor. From proletarian democracy and renegade Kautsky. I am going to talk about this deception further on in today's program. This is again quotation from Lenin's works. Proletarian democracy suppresses the exploiters, the bourgeoisie, therefore it doesn't play the hypocrite. hypocrite. It doesn't promise them liberties and democracies. It gives true democracy to workers. From proletarian democracy and renegade Kautsky. This sounds quite strict. Let's discuss whether this is legitimate and whether this is possible and whether this is necessary, humane and fair for the 21st century. Buzgalin interrupts the video and explains the upcoming video. This is an excerpt from my interview given for Station Mark's channel, where I am saying the same just to make it more precise. Words from the video. If you consider classical works by Marx and by Lenin, works by their associates, then you see that the dictatorship of proletarian is democratic power. The power of workers embodied in the Soviets and in other political forms, while bourgeoisie and other exploiter classes are deprived of political power. What does it mean? That real rights to participate in politics and are equal and much bigger than those within capitalist formation. These rights are not formal, they are real. These rights belong to everyone who's working. Those who don't work, those who exploit others, they are deprived of them. During the transformation period, where there still exists private economical sector, when there still remains remain left overs of capitalism, sometimes even feudalism. End of the video. Dear friends, this was a little introduction that I thought necessary to make. I am constantly being blamed for rejecting the dictatorship of proletariat, rejecting the role of industrial working class. People call me a revisionist. Some people see a train of other sins behind me, such as betrayal of Marx's ideas, denial of Lenin's ideas, invitation to conformism, and many other things. I think it will be right if we move another way and consider some tenets which are capstone for our work. I promised that you that this video will be played within time frame of my speech. This presentation took 3 minutes 14 seconds of my time. My presentation is going to be turned on. After it we will define the keystone tenets that seem crucial for me. Right now I'd like to thank you all for coming here. Many thanks to Plekhanov's house for doing their work for decades. Without their work, the left idea would probably just fade away or would not be as bright as it is today, notwithstanding everything that's going on at present. I'd like to thank all these guys who are shooting the video. Their work is truly communistic. Owing to their work, these videos are accessible to hundreds of thousands of people. Professor Popov is being watched by more than hundreds of thousands of people. Bosgalin is just now being watched by dozens of thousands of people. Let's consider the core tenets. First of all, Marxism is a living theory. It can't be static. It can't just consist of quotations. I didn't quote Lenin, who told us that we shouldn't engage in quotation mongering. I want to tell that Lenin was one of those who stated that Marx is outdated in many ways. Free competition has changed to disruption of commodity production and to domineering of big monopolies. Is this critique of Marx? Yes, it is. Is this development of Marx? Yes, it is. Proletariat today includes the labor aristocracy too. It is to be discussed whether we need the dictatorship of labor aristocracy. 
He said that there will be disruption in weak link of the chain and many other things that didn't exist in Marx's works. Let's continue. Then there came Lukács, then there came Gramsci, who wrote his books in jail, tens, hundreds of thousands of most interesting scientists who moved Marxism forward. Therefore, Marxism of the 20th century and Marxism of the beginning of the 21st century is not equal to only what was told by Marx and by Lenin. If we don't want to go forward, if our goal is to return to what there was 150 years ago, that is not right. This is not a Marxist idea. It's not in Lenin's way, if you like. We have made certain steps. I am not going to do a critical survey of development of theoretical discussions of Marxists in the West, in China, in Japan, in Australia, in our country. This wouldn't be right. I'll just say a few words about a movement that formed around Alternativa Journal post-Soviet school of critical Marxism. Once some people asked why critical Marxism? Because Marxism is always critical. Yes, butter should be called butter, although we all know that butter consists of many fake ingredients today. Marxism too is also made of fake ingredients today. The approach is quite often dogmatic. Today we've got a list of tenets which we need to think of thoroughly. Dialectics exists not only in progress but in digress too. The 20th century has demonstrated to us a lot of examples of diversions. We need to understand when and why there comes contrary forms and what price man has to pay for revolutions he has not accomplished. People often say that a revolution means blood, it leads to victims. But how many victims does a counter-revolution counter make? Does anyone think about it? We need to think about it because it is a magnificent pass over from realm of necessity to realm of freedom. Communism is realm of freedom. This is negation of the previous epoch, not just of capitalism. Problems can't be reduced just to nationalization of the capital, just to formal socialization. The problem can't be just let down to passing of surplus value to workers' possession. There is a wider circle of problems. All forms of social alienation should be annihilated. State and religion, relationship of production to of commodities and relationship of capitalist coercion, renegating feudalism and even slavery. There are lots of such forms and moreover conformity, inactivity, lack of will to get involved into social art, those things that Marx and his followers called to be social alienation. Modern market of today is a place governed by big corporations which manipulate people. This market is total, it is manipulative, it is a market of simulacra and symbols. It is a long way from what was depicted in the capital. Modern Marxism has described this today's market more than Marx or Lenin did. We have formulated more about what money is today, because money is a product of fictitious, Mar by Marx, financial, by Lenin and by Helferding, virtual, modern Marxism of 20th century and 21st century capital. That is another kind of money. It is not enough to know the third chapter of capital in order to understand the money of today. I am ready to go on this subject, but it is not our topic today. Let's continue. Thus, we need to follow the path of critical study of Marx's works, of development of Marxism and complementation of Marxism. I was asked to give my determinations. I have prepared them. Communism, yes, but we shouldn't forget that it is the world of free labor. This labor should be creative. I often hear rebukes that I forget about industrial proletariat. But industrial proletariat means real subjugation of labor to capital. We will remain within the world of submission of labor to dead labor until there exist machine and human being as part of the machine, as a supplement to screw gun, to conveyor, to whatever else. Are we to overcome this? Yes, we are. Creative labor. Can it be accessible to anyone? Half of our population could have been engaged in creative labor but for capitalism. Our epoch is different. 
communism means creative labor, free workflow, working in one's free time, labor that creates objects of culture. Let's take a look at our world in a different manner. Today one scientist can create the same amount of treasures as thousands of workers or tens of thousands of peasants. This is real today. Let's take a step further and let's consider material treasures. We keep on discussing how to take possession of a machine or how to take possession of a jacket. The key problem of the 21st century is how to take possession of knowledge. What our education, science and culture are going to look like. This is communism, this is the future socialism, not what we are having today. If we look at it, it turns out to be passing from the realm of necessity to realm of freedom. It is continuous and non-linear. There are victories and defeats. From feudalism we moved to capitalism. It took the mankind 500 years to move to capitalism. I hope that we will pass to socialism faster, to communism, to the initial phase of communi communism. But it is a difficult period, period of victories and defeats, reforms and anti-counter-reforms, revolutions and counter-revolutions. This is the first thing that we need to understand, this period of non-linear movement, transformation. The second thing is that in its precise meaning, socialism as ontology, as reality, it begins after left parties have seized the power. Capital still remains after that. Feudalism still remains after that. Bourgeois behavior of some people still remains, of people who don't want to be masters of their economics and politics. Yes, this is to be overcome in the future. This used to be fought against in the USSR. This is true. But socialism starts when we move from industrial workflow to creative workflow. This is the main task because it is if a person keeps on screwing the nuts, he will not become free even in material production, technologically. This is necessary, but it is not enough. We need to pass to such state of things when people can take possession of means of production and rule their economics for real. If we put a signboard communist, socialist, governmental, nothing is going to change. Today we have one governmental oil corporation, the other is private. Do they have any difference? Here and there hoggers are leading, hoggers who took possession of social treasures and use it for their own good and for the government administration and oligarchs good. No difference there except for the signboard. The question, what kind of government is it, is an important question. But if citizens still stay alienated from the government, if these governments will be working for them, but will not be theirs, problems will come. Let's continue. By the way, a little detail. In politics, socialism means dying of government out. It is not Bosgarin who stated it. This is in classical works of Marx and Lenin. Democracy is a term which my colleague and my opponent pronounces with great difficulty and as a rule only in negative context. He explains that democracy is fraud. You know, I will agree with you, Professor Popov, that it generally means a fraud in modern capitalistic society. But I can't totally agree with you in that matter. To obtain the right to speak, to get the right to create a trade union, to have the right to create a fraction in the parliament, thousands and dozens of thousands of our comrades paid their lives for it. Should you say it was in vain? I will say no. No, it wasn't in vain because it is a different story when formal democratic rules are relevant for a person at a factory, for a student at university, at school, for a retired person and for any boy or any girl. All this is totally different versus fascist terror or an authoritarian regime. In Europe in the 60s, also owing to the USSR, owing to huge effort of communists, socialists, trade unions, ecologists, etc. Left parties kept 20 to 30 percent of the parliament. In 1936 in Spain they won using democratic tools. In 1971 in Chile they also won. 
I know that their victory was followed by fascist takeover, but let's think about what was bad in it, that their victory was non-violent or that there was a fascist takeover. The next point. If we pass on to power of the people, then it turns out that the key problem there is creation of Soviets. It seems to me that Mikhail Vasilievich and I, we must have had the same attitude to in since our early childhood. Imperative mandate is the right of revoke. Should only factory working groups have that right? I think not only them. Nowadays people are united into plenty of pit peculiar social structures and each of them should have the right to have their representatives. This issue is still being discussed but imperative mandate is not doubted. Then there come disputes. Do we need formal democratic procedures after victory of left political powers? Soon we will come back to this issue but power of the people, which is the socialistic power, means freedom of speech, it is open discussion, it means submission of bureaucracy, limpidity and control of bureaucratic apparatus by people, that means powerful trade unions with ecological and social organizations, local self-administration, etc. Without these factors, it means degeneration. Without that, there are three persons that are equally talented, genial and wonderful. A grandfather, a, grand, a father and a grandson who are absolutely genial communists of North Korea. They are unanimously elected by people because they are the best. I'm quoting Professor Popov. If we are speaking about proletariat, this term is quite complicated, it takes its origin in the ancient Rome. I don't want to meander along sophisticated scientific debates. Let's just consider the relevance of the term. Industrial proletariat, right. I didn't quote previous programs where I told more than once that today in the 21st century industrial proletariat has considerably grown up in number. Gortz, who is claiming farewell to the working class, goodbye to the dying class of industrial workers, Gortz is right only in respect to nuclear countries, not to the countries of the whole world. Higher browed left intellectuals can see people only in the USA and in Western Europe. This is felony of left intellectuals. I'm quoting Buzgalin, who said that during shaggy times of Tsagolov. I haven't changed since then. Yes, today it is class of industrial workers as mass working class. Only this class? No. Mass creative class of today, including that of social segment, is a most interesting phenomenon. Teachers, doctors, all those who are working in social segment, who do not formally belong to waged workers, but who really are subdued by capital because our government is capitalistic. Do such people belong to proletariat? What about precariat? What about those teachers who are called creative class who are living from hand to mouth earning meager salaries? Social structure of capitalism of late already includes elements of socialism. It is dying out and moving to socialism indiffusely. Pure forms, such as existed within classic capitalism of the 19th century, are no more there. This is reality which is reflecting new practice. If one keeps on saying that only industrial proletariat or off you go, you have no idea of what Marxism is about, I say, excuse me, but this is out of date. Today we need a more detailed analysis. Today we are going to talk about versatile and multifarious class of waged workers and we th will think it out why a part of waged workers will support fascists, why a part of waged workers will support liberals. Some part will accompany us and we will find support in it, we communists. It is a very difficult subject. We can't just close our eyes and repeat the mantra that industrial worker is our god and this class should be in power. There have already been industrial workers who supported Hitler. There have been industrial workers who supported social democrats. There are industrial workers who support right liberal conservative Trump. This is a problem.
Yes, these industrial workers have been bluffed. But what value is there in class that can be bluffed? It really exists and it is bluffed. We need to use theory of Gramsci in order to understand how to unbluff it, so to speak, how to unbluff the industrial working class so that we could finish furnish support with it. Also, we need to consider that we can find support in creative salaried workers and workers of social segment who are living worse than industrial workers in Russia. Dictatorship of proletariat. Everything is easy here but for two moments. First, it is not clear who are proletariat of today. Second, it is not clear what is dictatorship. I have said hard-hitting words in my program. Now I'm going to say them once more, and you will attack me for that. Probably the majority of our audience will not agree with me. Today, the word dictatorship is working against Marx's theory and against socialism. Marx used this word in provocative manner, and he was right when he said that democracy is concealing its essence. Dictatorship of bourgeoisie, power of bourgeoisie. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Marx and Lenin told that they were not going to be hypocrites. Was Marx right? Yes, he was. But after that he kept on saying our power, our dictatorship, dictatorship of proletariat will gradually provide for realization of all freedom that bourgeois democracy can't give in reality. It will provide freedom of speech that bourgeoisie could not provide for. It will provide pluralism, variety, possibility of discussion that bourgeoisie couldn't give. It will give possibility of ruling of the country, which is impossible within bourgeois power. This part of Marx's saying is being constantly forgotten. There comes a question of great importance. This is a challenging question which I need to make right now, not having reached the end of my presentation. If we win, there comes a great dilemma. One option is that we are acting right and we let bourgeois political powers participate in political process. We are saying, we are strong, we will overcome you in honest and open struggle. We have seized your capital, basic means of production are in our hands, we are not afraid of you. Our ideology is against your ideology. We are cleverer, we are stronger, we are more talented. Verity is after us. The second option is the following. We are banning you because you are still cleverer, you still have capital. A huge capitalistic world is behind you, therefore we ban you. In any case, if we use shooting execution as means of ideological struggle, we will lose the battle. Ideology can't be overcome by shooting execution. Ideology can be overcome only with ideology, science by science. But let's move further on. A few words about the USSR and I'll finish. I love my motherland. My motherland is the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics. My motherland is not Russia. I say it right away. I feel at home it in Uzbekistan, in Lithuania, in Ukraine. All this is my motherland. This is a huge project of huge practice when tens of millions of people started living in communistic way, in a warped manner, sideways, askew in the beginning, still in communist way. There was nothing of the kind anywhere else. This was a great achievement of our country, but in our project, in our practice, in our life, there were two lines. There was a red line of communism and a grey wicked line of bourgeois and bureaucracy paternal power. If in twenties, at the 11th Congress, there were 500 delegates and half of them were workers, I have these data in my presentation if you wish, then at the 18th Congress, the most Stalinistic of all Stalinistic Congresses, 70% were party establishment, workers were almost absent there. This was a Congress, not even government of the country. In the Supreme Soviet, there could be found a few ostentatious workers and peasants, but this doesn't change anything. This is the problem. 
the problem that bourgeois bureaucratic tendency won, unfortunately, the struggle with communism. This tendency has led to temporary annihilation of our country, of our project, of our socialism. If we want to win again, we need to understand that we will have to struggle not only by creating an ideal Tsar or a correct general secretary who will solve all our problems for us, but by means of self-organizing, by toning our social muscles in our struggle for socialization of capitalism and for reforms, by growing our brains not to let us make theoretical and practical mistakes. Social brains, theoretical work and ultimately there will be a victorious constructive revolution, not a fascist takeover of right powers. Bourgeoisie of Russia will help us by little in this. Another argument in dispute with Professor Popov. Russian bourgeoisie will not make a haste to enhance production in their native country. Basically, this bourgeoisie is more outdated. It is mean, atrocious and caddish than bourgeoisie of well-developed countries and of many Latin America countries. It is half feudal, fused with bureaucratic clans. Any hope for union with it is an illusion. There is a little fraction of representatives of this social layer and of intellectuals who support them. They are ready to agree to social capitalism in Scandinavian style. By the way, they are far ahead from Russia and we need to sway it out. This little fraction of capitalists agree to social capitalism when a bourgeois will pay from 50 to 80 percent of his income. Such capitalism that will allow free high school and free tertiary study. Capitalism that will make medical service free. Capitalism that will make minimal unemployment compensation enough to provide for decent living. It is already possible in Russia with gross domestic product amount that we now have. Some people tell me this is a revolution. No, this is capitalism, my friends. But to get it, we need to struggle. First of all, we need to struggle with our native class that is in power, class that finds support in our own bourgeoisie. Thank you for your attention. Presenter. Colleagues, 23 minutes are rendered to Mikhail Vasilievich. You're welcome, Mikhail Vasilievich. Mikhail Vasilievich Popov. Hello, dear comrades. I want to tell you that it has been a long time since Alexander Vladimirovich and I have known each other. First, he had worked as the chair of political economy of Moscow State University. This chair was leading my doctoral thesis together with Kalganov, together with the chair, Professor Tsagolov, who stood for planning instead of vendibility. He prepared a special textbook which stood aside all other economical textbooks of Soviet times because vendibility wasn't accentuated there. Quite the opposite, planning was presented there as the main category of socialism. It happened so that when Alexander Vladimirovich prepared his thesis, he came to our university to the Institute of Further Training of St. Petersburg State University. It was called Leningrad State University then. We, as leading organization, estimated his thesis. I was a reviewer and I gave positive estimation to his thesis. Well, I need to say that I agree with many things told by Alexander Vladimirovich, especially with his statements that he is for dictatorship of proletariat and those who are against it should be fought against. I think that's right. Still, I'd like to describe what I see in our political surroundings time and again. Communist Party of Russian Federation, totally with its ideologists, always takes out dogmatically only that quotation. Marx says there, there that during transient period of passing from capitalism to communism, dictatorship of proletariat is necessary. The idea that dictatorship of proletariat is necessary during the whole period until total disappearance of classes, it is shown, proved and grounded in Lenin's work Great Start. This work is not too large, it won't take long to study this work by Lenin. 
Nevertheless, the comrades who speak about the dictatorship of proletariat make believe that there never was such a statement. It turns out that it is possible to have a state which is neither dictatorship of proletariat nor dictatorship of bourgeoisie. If it exists during the initial stage of communism, it means during socialism, it is a state of proletarian dictatorship. When it ceases to be proletarian dictatorship, that means the initial stage of communism is over and pass over to capitalism is on. That is what we all are seeing today. This is quite a simple idea. If you go to Moscow from Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, then you first need to get to Balagoya. If I quote then that we need to go to Balagoya, will that be right? Yes, it will. But don't we need to go further? Is it enough to get to Balagoya? In order to have completed communism, we shouldn't stop at the stage of constructing of socialism. What is the nature of socialist state? It is class nature. This is why I think the question which Alexander Vladimirovich considers to be a complicated one, I think it is an easy matter. Lenin told more that than once the dictatorship is defined quite easily. Dictatorship is power not limited by any laws. Any laws. Why? Because the ruling class, if it is ruling, it has organized its state living in such a matter, manner that all laws take their origin from interests of the ruling class, and these are the laws that will be accepted. Therefore, I think that the problem with democracy can be solved quite easily. Democracy can be either proletarian, which is based on such laws that provide for proletarian dictatorship, and it provides for interests of huge majority of working people, not only proletariat. Why? Because all petty bourgeoisie is not proletariat. It creates material amenities, other representatives of petty bourgeoisie are acting within sphere of non-material production, so to speak. Although they don't produce material goods, they behave in the same way. It doesn't matter for them what they are doing, it matters only what they will get for it. The well-being of these people also will be improved, as they belong to the category whose interests will be protected by proletarian dictatorship. Thus, it can be said that proletarian dictatorship is true democracy. If we analyze the word democracy, then demos means people, kratos means power, right? If this power provides for interests of vast majority is democratic power, no matter how it is designed. But if this power allows chatting on sundry topics, gathering around anywhere, even if it is not persecuted, this is not democracy, it is dictatorship of bourgeoisie. How is it formed? Dictatorship of bourgeoisie can be formed in two ways. Either dictatorship of bourgeoisie is formed as bourgeois democracy, and here I totally agree with Alexander Vladimirovich that bourgeois democracy is better than fascism. Is there anyone who thinks that fascism is better than bourgeois democracy? No, no one. This is evident. It is very important to highlight that we can gather around, speak out our opinions, post them where we find it necessary. In any case, fewer people will see them in contrast with those who watch TV. We and our discussions will drown among the sea of other opinions, totally different ideas. Bourgeoisie knows quite well that all this will not balk its dictatorship. However, great efforts we make while discussing here. So we can speak of democracy as of bourgeois democracy, when it is power of minority, which, as any other democracy, caters for dictatorship of its own class. That means power which is not limited by any laws, because bourgeoisie will adopt laws which are needful for its own self. When it was needed to pass to the law of pension reform, it was adopted. How did the majority accept it? Negatively? Do you think anyone doubted that the majority would take it negatively? Did Putin ignore it, or did Medvedev ignore it, or other people in Duma had no idea of it? They all knew about it. So what? This is dictatorship of bourgeoisie with democracy. Anyone is free to speak against it. I protested against it and other comrades protested against it. Feel contented. This is democracy. 
It means that I will interfere with your life and spoil it and you will protest and make speeches. That's why everybody is called out and they keep on saying as parrots. We are going to make protest action. We are getting throttled, we protest against it. We are getting killed, we will protest. We are deprived, we are going to protest against it. Protest. What is it about? This means a completely negative task. Even a simple strike, common strike, presumes statement of demands. Demanding means something which is positive. We demand this, not just say that we won't go there. If I start telling where I will not go, then after I finish my speech you will not be able to get out of there because it will take endless time. I think this issue is quite important. I'd like to focus the attention during the little time which is left to focus our attention on the most important thing, that is what we have lost. We have lost socialism. Socialism in the USSR appeared in the middle of the 30s. What is socialism? Socialism, if we are to give a definition, is communism in its initial stage, or undeveloped communism, incomplete communism, if you like. Therefore, unlike Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, who used to say that the current generation of Soviet people will live in communism, we have to recognize that the people of the middle of the 30s, the generation to which neither Alexander Vladimirovich nor I belong to, that generation lived in communism. Why so? Well, to be exact, I lived a little time under communism. You too, Alexander Vladimirovich, lived for a bit during communism. That's why we like communism. I too love communism. What does it mean that communism is undeveloped, incomplete? It is communism with moment of negation in it. What negation in particular? Well, Marx had explained that it is such communism that evolves from old social formation and carries imprints of the ascendant formation in all ways, in economics, in morale, in mentality. We don't need to prove that there are many fools who live within capitalist formation. Even if it is socialism, it contains imprints of capitalism in economics and this leads to appearing of considerable number of fools or stodgy people or confused people or frightened people, etc. Therefore, it is not needed to list morale and men mentality. It is enough to mention economic relations that bear birthmarks of capitalism. Therefore, we could say that the contradiction of progress of socialism in the USSR, which came into apex when the socialism was constructed, this is the contradiction between communistic nature of socialism and its negation, which is due to capitalistic origin. We come to the conclusion that progression means struggle of communistic basis with its negation. Negation of communism is what leads to capitalism, there is no other option here. What is negation of communism? Communism comes from the word communis, which means common. All that is in interests of society is communistic. What is in interests of individual persons, no matter what positions they occupy and how they are called and no matter what labels or scarves they wear, all this is contradictory to communism. All that matters is if they are acting in the interests of society or not. So, it can be said that socialism means struggling for communism, struggling against its negation, struggling against efforts of placing someone's interests as capstone instead of interests of society as the whole, social interests in general. Thus, if it is struggling for communism and communism means common, then production within socialistic formation is purely social, not commercial. If it directly serves the interests of society, then that is implemented in the aim of socialistic production, providing of complete well-being and all-sided development of all members of society. And this aim was being implemented. That's why we love our country so much, the country which unfortunately we have lost and which we have to recreate. Therefore, the second contradiction which is economical is the contradiction between straightforward social nature of socialistic production and its negation. 
What means negation of straightforward social nature of production? It is in commercial momentum of production. We have observed it. Notwithstanding that our production is supposed to serve the interests of society, we all know quite well that these are different things, society and state. Society is one thing, representatives of the society is another thing. How many times it was when not only the super superior but also the inferior served not the interests of society but on the contrary they acted according to the principle let's give to the society the smallest and the worst part and let's take the best and the biggest part from it lenin too warned of that at the early stages of soviet power Socialistic production is developed within this contradiction, the contradiction between the straightforward social nature of production and commerciality. Commerciality, which doesn't organize separate commercial production, but which stays as negative momentum in straightforward social production. When index of nomenclature was removed, Professor Maisenka and I wrote a book under the title Democratic Centralism is the Basic Principle of Managing of Socialistic Economy. This book was published in 1975, 15,000 printed copies. We were the first to criticize directly all those marketeers who pushed us into the direction of counter-revolution. We understood that on a full scale when we plunged deeper into the struggle with those who occupied positions of market socialism. This struggle is inevitable and if we implement priority of social interests. What priority do we have now? the priority of private interests. They are proclaimed everywhere, even postal address now starts with surname, then house, street and country. If I become a minister, then as a person of principle, what interests am I to defend? My own, my private interests. Of course, being a minister, from time to time I will do something which concerns my ministry. But the main point is that while I am at the apex of governmental power, I need to collect as much wealth as I can. The majority of our governmental officials are preoccupied with that. Was there such like tendency among governmental officials during Soviet times? Of course there was. While this tendency was being repressed and banished up to capital punishment, as Alexander Vladimirovich mentioned, it didn't result in rep pain and in exploitation of all people. When Yeltsin announced at the meeting of Supreme Council the removal of capital punishment for economical felony, there were so much glee and rapture that was a real feast. I was even surprised when I heard that. I thought, why so much joy? I couldn't predict that the day will come that when it will be easy to steal billions from the people. Of course, governmental officials only conceal their income and surplus value they are getting. They conceal it behind their salaries. If a miner earns 50,000 rubles and members of the board of directors of Rosneft earn 28 million a month, that means that surplus value they get in 28 million minus 50,000. This surplus value proves that these capitalists are joined into one governmental congregated capitalist and they feel as snug as a bug in a rug. They have made privatization on a quite skimpy scale. We hear them say, this is a broad scale privatization. 70% of gross domestic product is produced by government-owned factories. Governmental officials there look like people who were assigned to see to the implementation of production, but what are they doing there first of all? They fulfill the priority of their private interests. But we have moved a bit far. Therefore, I come back to the contradiction of which I have told. This contradiction gets solved via struggling for priority of economic interests of society, but we still have division into classes that we haven't overcome yet. Division into classes can't be overcome within socialistic formation.
When it is overcome, it will not be socialism, the lowest stage of communism. It will be the highest stage of communism. Until this moment comes, dictatorship of proletariat is needed. This has been explained by Lenin. Some comrades have looked into works by Gramsci. But they haven't looked into Lenin's works, or they have, but leave that apart. Turn into Busgalin. This is a slight hint on your account. Busgalin Alexander Vladimirovich, please, would you tell me what proletariat is, because I didn't understand it. Popov Mikhail Vasilich, of course I will. Proletariat are people who are deprived of property. This is the first definition. Deprived of property. The leading force of proletariat, as Lenin said, should not be just proletariat, but based in cities industrial proletariat of factories and plants. They make part of proletariat. There is a suffering class which suffers a lot, all people belong to it. But all people can't lead the struggle. Why? We intelligent workers, professors, who we get our bread and butter from from bourgeoisie, not from working class. It was within socialism that we earned our living from working class and from Soviet government. Now we have to get our money from other class. We are paid by it. Therefore, it is not surprising that all those representatives of mental labor can suffer even more than industrial workers. Still, they can't be head of working masses exploited class on its way to total removal of classes. People who are able to be head of this struggle are settled in cities, industrial workers of plants and factories. They are big in number, these industrial workers. Alexander Vladimirovich was totally right when he told that. Thus, we need to discuss the contradiction which still exists within socialistic formation and we should not conceal it. This contradiction is between non-class nature of communism. It means socialism is non-class society, but in its initial stage. What does that mean, its initial stage? This means it contains its negation. It means division of society into classes is not fully overcome. Therefore, the contradiction between non-class nature of communism and not fully overcome class division still exists. It gets solved by struggle of working class for the interests of the class. It is the only class which expresses interests of all working people, of all those who suffer, who Alexander Vladimirovich is soliciting for, and I join him readily. Interests of nurses, interests of doctors can't be protected by nurses or doctors themselves. If they are not paid, they just perish. Interests of scientists should be protected too. Scientists are being banished as a mob. All institutes have been snatched from the Academy of Sciences. Even Tsars tolerated that Academy of Sciences should have its own institutes. Would scientists spend more spend money worse than some officials who created federal agency for scientific organizations. Our institutes that are doing research belong to this agency now. If a country is going nowhere, what kind of prognosis should scientists make for it? That it is going nowhere. Putin and Sergeyev have agreed upon what you are allowed to do, not plans they have frozen the law of strategic planning for three years. Not we, it were they who did that. But we scientists are still allowed to come together, have a chat, make prognoses and publish them wherever we like. Please feel free to say what you like, it is democracy here. I agree that democracy is better than sitting in jail, this is for sure, I will not object to that. The contradiction is solved by planned implementation of interests of the working class through governmental system of centralized management. There we get the same contradiction between planned nature of socialistic industry and elements of spontaneity of its organization. Elements of spontaneity also include that we can't know everything while we are making a plan. Everyone can't know everything. Some people say stupid things as if everything had been planned until the last nail in the USSR. Let me inform you that at a governmental level party nomenclature was assigned in number of 1,000 persons. 
At ministry level there were only 17,000 people. All the rest was at the lowest level, in executive committees and so on. But the matter is that there exists a contradiction in position of each working person. Within socialistic formation this contradiction goes between that worker is interested in increase of wealth of society. Social funds will accrue and a worker will get a higher salary. But for him it is more profitable to get a bigger portion of a less sized pie. He is interested in that too. How can we provide for that this contradiction gets solved to benefit the first interest, not the second one? This is what the system of governmental planned centralized management is about. It implements the dictatorship of proletariat and provides for subordination of all people, the working and non-working. Non-working people get a clear answer. One who doesn't work shouldn't have means for living. No shooting repressions are needed then. What for? Let him stay hungry, that's all. It is his own matter. He is a person of free will. If he wants to work, he will get the work. If he chooses to stay hungry, let him do it until he dies. Nowadays some people stay hungry to show their protest. Let him be hungry as a protest against socialism. We've got a question here. What are the limits of political coercion? What limits can be there if it is a dictatorship? Are there any limits within bourgeois dictatorship? No, there are not. Are there any limits within the dictatorship of proletariat? Not either. Because any dictatorship, be it proletarian dictatorship or bourgeois dictatorship, means power which is not limited by any laws. What laws can be accorded to the unrestricted power? Thus, our task is that we should struggle for such a society where there will be no government. It means there will be no repression. We acknowledge repression only in one sense, repression towards delinquents and thugs who ruin our society. Lenin told that the rich and thieves, layabouts and hooligans are enemies of socialism. They need to be repressed without any pity. Any sentimentality towards them is a crime against socialism. Presenter, we need to interrupt our record for a couple of minutes in order to put additional seats for our comrades. Mikhail Vasilich Popov, this is the dictatorship of proletariat. Presenter, both Alexander Vladimirovich and Mikhail Vasilievich have three minutes for asking questions to each other. Alexander Vladimirovich Buzgalin, colleagues, Mikhail Vasilievich, I find myself in a difficult situation because I started my speech fir the first and that was unexpected. But let it be like that. Honestly speaking, I got lost in all this speech of Mikhail Vasilievich, so I would probably like to ask Mikhail Vasilievich to clear out some things. Mikhail Vasilich Popov, you are welcome. Buzgalin, if there are not any limits to political repression, then let's start right from the end. It turns out then that those who are in power will be able to use this power to destroy as many people as they find necessary. The first question is, do you agree with this? Popov, no. Buzgalin, then the limits are still there. Popov, these are not limits. Buzgalin, I'd like to ask Mikhail Vasilievich to make a more detailed comment. Presenter, questions are to prolong during 10 minutes. Buzgalin, the second question. Honestly speaking, I haven't understood concerning dictatorship of proletariat within socialistic formation. If there is no bourgeois class, then it is the dictatorship of proletariat within socialistic formation. If there is no bourgeois class, then it is the dictatorship of proletariat against all other working people and petty bourgeoisie. Whether I get it right that apart from industrial proletariat that is living in cities, all who re remain should be deprived of election rights, rights to create political organizations and other political rights. Popov, no, you didn't get it right. Buzgalin, if that is wrong, then against whom is proletarian dictatorship aimed at? Popov, proletarian dictatorship is aimed against efforts of petty bourgeoisie to take more and better and to give less and worse to others. Presenter, only two minutes are left for asking questions. 
Buzgalin, I'd like to ask Mikhail Vasilievich to give a more concrete answer, because it is impossible to dispute with serene mottos like to stand for the best against all that is bad. Popov, feel free to ask me questions. Buzgalin, I am using my three minutes. Please don't give answers such as against efforts made by someone. Popov, you are to ask questions, not make a speech. Buzgalin, I am using my three minutes as I consider it proper. I am asking you, against whom in particular is this power aimed at? The third question, how can one prevent degrading of governmental power into self-sufficing power that should subordinate citizens and act against interests of citizens? What mechanisms, in your opinion, guarantee the power and political nomenclature from such degradation? To illustrate your answer, please, could you tell me if you think that in various periods the power in the USSR was subjected to interests of citizens? Do you think that what was happening in 1937 was in interests of citizens? Don't you think that if it was the absence of control from citizens led to that nomenclature swapped its power for property? And there is another question concerning the modern state of affairs. In a series of your public speeches, as far as I understood, you've said that Russian bourgeoisie, together with leading left forces, are able to provide for regeneration of our country in this struggle with American capital. Did I get it right? And don't you think that Russian bourgeoisie is nothing better than American capital, but for using feudal methods? These are all my questions. Presenter. Mikhail Vasilievich, you've got three minutes to pose your questions. Popov, my questions have been noted down and sent to Alexander Vladimirovich. Now I'm just going to list them. When was the beginning of the first phase of communist formation in the USSR? The second question. Class nature of Soviet government. I can pass them to you. Character of socialistic production. Dictatorship of proletariat and democracy. Fifth question. Contradictions of development of socialism. Sixth question. When did counter-revolution occur in the USSR? Seventh question. When did transition from socialism to capitalism begin in the USSR? Buzgalin, thank you. Presenter. Mikhail Vasilievich didn't use two minutes of his time, therefore he will have additional two minutes while answering questions of Alexander Vladimirovich. Are you ready? Who's going to be the first? Popov. Maybe that will be me, because he was the first to ask me questions, then I will be the first to answer. Concerning limits of repression, let me tell you that once again, we need to understand what dictatorship is. Dictatorship is power which is not limited by any laws, therefore we should not seek for limits there. We need to look for the essence of dictatorship. The essence of proletarian dictatorship is providing for interests of vast majority of workers. Also, it is keeping the communal property and fighting against private property. Or, as Marx and Engels said, all their theory can be expressed with one phrase, annihilation of private property. Therefore, all impulses of creation of private property are to be repressed thoroughly. The second question, against whom? It is not against anybody. Within conditions of socialism, the dictatorship of proletariat can't be against anybody. Only during transitional period it could be against bourgeoisie, maybe against some elements of petty bourgeoisie. However, in general, petty bourgeoisie used to be an ally of proletariat. Therefore, it can't be said that the dictatorship of proletariat is against somebody within socialistic formation. That's why Lenin said that it is a semi-state, there is no class that should be systematically repressed. Nevertheless, it should be against any antisocial actions, whoever might do them and whoever these people may be called, whatever positions they might take, either workers or party officials, ministers, secretaries, secretary generals. If the dictatorship of proletariat doesn't fight against this, capitalism comes back. 
How can one prevent distortion of these principles? To be sure, the basic principle is the Soviet power. And Soviet power was partially lost in the middle of 30s, namely in 1936, when there started socialistic period. Elections in factories and in plants ceased to be organized, notwithstanding that the program of the party, right until its annihilation in 1961, stated that the main element of election and the main cell of the state is not a territorial unit, but a plant, a factory. This provided for the relevant nature of the state. That was the main point. Why is it so important? Because if elections are based on territorial principle, as it started to be the case in 1936, no one could be revoked. The infestation of governmental and party apparatus was inevitable under such a system. Because no one could be called back, there was no practical possibility of revocation. And vice versa, if deputies are elected in working groups, the whole group is voting. Also, they can come together and revoke their candidate in any moment. Therefore, there is a possibility to elect any person, be it a white-collar worker or a representative of any other profession. But the whole working group should vote for this person. It should be said that in the existing regulations of elections there was a loophole. Deputies were to be elected by working groups, then some number of these deputies were directed to the Congress of Soviets as supreme institution. It turned out to be so that not only deputies elected by working groups, but flotsam and jetsam could be directed to the Congress. Therefore, it became possible to destroy this whole system, which looked good. It became so that the system of Soviet power was destroyed by a single explanatory note, number two, which was there, in this system of such tragic fate. Reading the question, what in your opinion happened in 1937? In 1937, as in 1936 and in 1935, we had proletarian dictatorship with red tape distortions. We have discussed it with you on the phone. Bureaucratic distortions can be numerous or they can be scarce. Comrade Beria was assigned to his position and studied the cases, then he dramatically decreased the number of violations which were there. People who produced aberrations were made responsible for that. You know that Yagoda and Yezhov were sentenced to death. Are you against this capital measure? I am not. Because they are guilty of bringing to death many people who were true to communism and to socialism. If we keep on letting such things, they will go on. So I think that in 37, 38 and 39 our state was proletarian dictatorship. It was like this until 1965, when it was taken to pieces, when economical system became totally changed. As you know, in 1965 the profit was made first priority instead of workforce productivity. Profit, cost-effectiveness and volume of sales were made to be fund-creating ratio. In 61, the proletarian dictatorship was erased from the program of the party. More than that, the report of the Secretary-General stipulated that the class fight has come to an end. In fact, that fight was against petty bourgeois impulses interest of doing less and worse and getting more from the society. Unfortunately, such interest was of mass scope even then. In Khrushchev's period they were set free. There was even a law about petty stealing which invited not to steal a lot but to steal in little quantities, then the person was not brought to court. This was real. And also it was proclaimed that class fight is over. Well, if it was over, then the organized fight of working class under the leadership of party was over too. Petty bourgeois tendencies did not vanish, they thrived. Thus we got bourgeois dictatorship. 
What happened in 1961, I consider it to be the return turn of the screw, which can be called political counter-revolution. It progressed and reached the restoration of capitalism in 1991, not just counter-revolution. Thus, it was a transition from communism to capitalism. Concerning getting united with the Russian bourgeoisie, how could you think about any unity of working class adherents of proletarian dictatorship with bourgeoisie of Russia? No unity is possible there. Still, if a bourgeois calls a spade to be a spade, we should agree with that. You have used twice the term landliner. Workers at our chair at the university also like to use that term, and I keep asking them if they know what a nonlinear function is. Linear function is that like y equals kx plus b. Then where did you get the nonlinearity from? There exist other notions, so that one shouldn't snatch non-relevant terms from mathematics and try to make use of them. Now, to such ignorant terms like social capitalism, socialized capitalism, how can it be socialized if any capitalism is social? Socialized means belonging to society. Social formation, even a fascist one, is a social formation. There used to be such a society as fascist society. There can't be any socialized capitalism, and there can't be any separate social state. It is clear that state is a social term, a term that is relevant to society. How can a state be non-social? Such stupid things, too, which have appeared since Brezhnev's period, like economic Economics should be economical, then physics should be physical, chemistry chemical, etc. And this is claimed to be the most recent discovery in Marxism. Alexander Vladimirovich, why are you making such declarations? Please, don't do that. And about the Russian bourgeoisie. Working class of today should lead class fight against Russian bourgeoisie. If it turns out that Russian bourgeoisie does something good for the development of industry, which happens very scarcely, it doesn't, does a lot more to destroy the industry. If it does something good for industrial development, we should raise our heads for that. But we can't influence that. The only way for us is the strike method, first of all. Not protest actions, which don't change anything, but working out strike struggling. This will give us the way to creation of Soviet power and of going back to the USSR. Is my time over? Thank you. Okay, I'll just turn my second meter off. It has become even more difficult, as it seems we are speaking in, so to speak, perpendicular way. We don't hear each other. I've just been kindly asked by Professor Popov not to speak banalities and boring things. Speaking about socialistic capitalism, I'd like to address the same proposal to Professor Popov. You see, if everything went according to teachers' books of 30s or 50s, and if there didn't occur serious changes in our country, in the world, in social structure, in productive forces, then maybe it would be possible to talk about economics accentuated on goods and non-accentuated uh, on goods, about nomenclature, index, etc. Some distant reverberations of this are still of some interest, not only for researchers of history, of economy, but also for future planning of socialism. That can be so. Though, however, big data create a different environment in planning sphere, and there it will be quite a different discussion. But let's be consecutive. First of all, I have to answer these questions that were written for me. You see, unlike Mikhail Vasilievich, I think that the old good statement that there is communism, there is the first stage of communism, there is passage to the first stage, all these statements need to be thoroughly corrected. Some people have built up a theory on the basis of just a few phrases said by Marx and a series of Lenin's sayings. The real situation is much more complicated. 
when I was speaking about non-linearity, okay, let it be another term, let it be movement, which includes regression, counter-reforms and counter-revolution. This is reality. Becoming of communism implies that during a long period of, let me underline that, of the global process, it is no use to consider it separately. The becoming of communism implies their difficult steps back. Therefore, the question when the first stage of communist formation won in the USSR, this question is useless. My answer to it can be like this. It never won. Considerable, fundamental, important red crimson line, which included development of communistic relations, let me highlight it, communistic relations. It began in our country since the 20s and became stronger in permanent contradiction. This line proceeded with great difficulties, not only owing to fight with bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie. I think this gives start to a new line of confrontation. People involved into the process of social creativity create together new social relations. Self-reliance relations in factories, self-reliance relations in regions, relations of social appropriation, relations of fair spreading out, relations of creative education that was free of charge, new culture relations, etc. Creators of their own lives, this is what communism is about. It is when we together associate in building our own social life. It is not that something is said or not said in the Constitution. A signboard was placed. If it is governmental or private, it is when this real process really exists. Those of us who are not involved into this process, those who, using old expressions, who recreate old life, a conformist can work for bureaucracy too. He may be sincere in making of himself a brick in the bureaucratic wall, thus being an adversary of communism. However, formally he may not grab for private property and may not be accentuated on private means. This is a totally different subdivision. This subdivision was the basis of problem of our communism. The USSR was ruined by petty bourgeoisie, anti-social creativity, if you like. This is what we are to understand. When we are discussing protests and strikes, I say, well, it's wonderful to call for a strike, but if we are not able to bring people to participate in a meeting, then what strike are you talking about? This is not a project making, not even naivety. I would call that a more slashy word, but in such intelligent audience, this is not dignified. The problem is in making people social creators who will be able to make up a trade union which will be able for to make constructive protest action. There is a motto to it which you have already mentioned. Stop increasing retirement age. By the way, when people went out in 2005 and blocked streets, the government found money and there occurred no monetization of privileges. So it can turn out in another way. There is this just a little example of social creativity and conformism. Those who didn't go out then, they helped the government. Unfortunately, in the USSR, a conformist brought the nomenclature in which, which cut socialist tendencies out. Absence of carefully thought out system, control mechanisms of observing the power from under, not only the factory unit principle and imperative mandate. We agree with each other concerning the imperative mandate. I will reiterate that the absence of strong independent trade unions, absence of possibility of uniting people, lack of real possibility to criticize the power, it was absent in the USSR and during, during Stalin's period, people were sentenced to death for it. Lack of absence to create alternate political communist organization which would say, well, folks, you have grabbed privileges for yourself and you are working not in interests of citizens. You just claim it. In reality, you are working for the interests of your proper social layer in order to grab private property in the future. 
It was all said in 1927 by the opposition, and what came out of it? We communists think it must not be like that. Those communists who tried to say this were killed in a slew. This was a true fight. But it wasn't a fight with bourgeoisie or petty bourgeoisie, it was a fight of suburbia nomenclature with communists who relied on social workers. The nomenclature, which relied on a Philistine, couldn't win totally. Otherwise, it wouldn't have won the war with fascism. This nomenclature needed Soviet system, it needed enthusiasm, it needed communists, so it produced reproduced the Soviet system from one hand and from the other hand it throttled it. From one hand Yezhov was given a higher position, he was given full authority. First it was taken no heed that he was killing people, then from the other hand he was sentenced to death. Such practice has been familiar since Egyptian pharaoh's times, nothing new there character of socialistic production is the next question. Socialistic production includes two components, if that is passage from realm of necessity to realm of freedom. One component is communism. It is really social and public. I have written it in my doctoral thesis as well as in my candidate's dissertation and you were right to thank me for that. I am grateful to you for that and I have been writing the same things up to now. A shoot of communism is planning system on the basis of first-hand public work in highly socialized sector and free movement of resources where everyone can obtain everything. By the way, this is a huge problem taking off the intellectual private property and passage to everyone's ownership of everything. If Mikhail Vasilievich tells a few words on this topic afterwards, I would be happy. Without communistic boons, informational and spiritual, the movement forward is impossible. This is even more important today than ownership of machines. Today an intellectual product costs more than produce of machine building complex. The world of today is different. Next question – contradiction of development of socialism. What you told about the contradiction of becoming communism and of dying out realm of necessity, including production of goods, government, repression, religion, etc., this is true. This is not to doubt, it is evident. We have never argued on this point and never will. It is certain that we need to support communistic tendency. It is also for sure that during a long period trails of capitalistic system will preserve themselves within becoming communism. They will stay in economy, in politics and so on. But this contradiction is not a single one. The most interesting contradiction is inner contradiction of communism, but it is not our today's topic. When did counter-revolution occur in the USSR? Well, I'd rather not discuss the history of the USSR. You might have noticed that I avoided saying anything in my introduction, because the lessons for the future are even more important. I'm definitely going to speak about it in my finishing speech. I think that it happened because the moment when governmental and political powers separated themselves from the control from under, when elements of socialistic bourgeois and any other democracy were removed, the democracy which means power of demos, power of people to possess real democratic power. In the end of 30s the counter-revolution occurred. It wasn't finished then, because the USSR remained duplicitous then, it conserved a strong communistic tendency and it always preserved bureaucratic nomenclature tendency based on Philistines. This contradiction brought the main difficulty, difficult challenge into the future. Who was going to win whom? This question was always there. It was open. By the way, the period of Khrushchev is being bitterly criticized. If you look through materials about this period, the payment for education in senior years was annihilated. It still remained in Stalin's period. Higher education was made free for people. Lots of bureaucratic privileges that existed during Stalin's period were annulated, thus providing some control over party governmental nomenclature. These positive steps were tiny. Freedom of speech was provided there appeared a possibility of development of communistic tendency. Research towns and boroughs were created, universities and many other things. Students' fees, passports, retirement allowances for collectors, 
collective farm workers and many other things appeared. Please consider the facts, dear colleagues. All this was basically made by the same methods, by the same people who originated from the same nomenclature and it was over quite soon. The dynamics was a bit different, but this is not the main point. The main point is the restoration of capitalism when it started. It started in a latent manner right from the beginning. Since the moment when nomenclature and its descendants, so to speak, since they got involved in the restoration of bourgeois way of living, and when the majority of citizens of the USSR began searching for amenities and started solving tasks of a philistine, a conformist, not of a socialist creator. It was when we lost social creativity, communistic enthusiasm. This was the starting point of degradation. It reached its climax in Brezhnev's period. During Gorbachev's being in power, there was a strenuous struggle of three tendencies. One of them is well known. It is a bourgeois tendency. Another one is less known. It's a conservative tendency calling for getting back to the dictatorship and thus solving all problems. And the last one was a communistic tendency, the weakest of the three, democratic Marxist tendency. But it too was based on corporate responsibility of working groups. In this we were also unanimous. Now a postscriptum. The p key problem for us is a question of limits of political repression and where dictatorship of proletariat finds itself in this context. The main difference from the dictatorship of proletariat, if we like to use this term, although I think it doesn't come pat here, I would prefer to use power of working class within, if that is necessary, limitation of political rights of exploiting classes or counter-revolutionists. If there is no necessity, we don't need to limit it. It can be fought against using political methods. It depends on how strong we are and who's surrounding us. But the main problem of such power is prevention of its degrading to dictatorship of limited circle of bureaucratic nomenclature oligarchy. If oligarchy is a lame term, then let it be a limited bureaucratic nomenclature group. This is a key difficulty where all socialists, socialist adepts tripped over. And there is the second problem, which the planning economy could not solve. It could solve problems of communism, problems of free, all-accessible, excellent education. Communistic topic of creative labor is the material and technical basis of communism. It managed to do the same in public health service, it reached the same heights in culture. It couldn't solve the problem of bourgeois industrial production. It failed to solve the problem of shortages. Venezuela is facing the same problem now. Practically all systems bumped into it. China is solving this problem in a bourgeois way. It is leading to huge loss. This is a challenge to the nation, but the main challenge, I reiterate, is that we give the name of proletarian dictatorship to the system which should be the most democratic of all, because the word dictatorship is a bad word. We do not turn it into the power of people with all its attributes, which I have written out here, including imperative mandate and the right of revoking of a deputy, right for demonstrations and rallies, freedom of speech, etc., including s real self-management at factories or just at boroughs, including powerful society of citizens. Chavez has got a special term, the so-called socialism of the society of citizens. If we are not following this direction, if we do not pursue you the path of dying out of government if we intensify the apparatus of repressions and augment the power of limited circle we cut off sprigs of communism and of socialism this is our main lesson and this is our main problem the most important thing which I wanted to highlight in my answer here is that as soon as we kill these sprigs the nomenclature together with bourgeoisie the majority of population starts calling for restoration of capitalism. This situation is absolutely expectable. Unfortunately, this is what Venezuela is facing today, Cuba too. They are making the same mistake as we had made. Political repressions and enhancement of political dictatorship doesn't bring any solution here. 
at last concerning the power which is not limited by any laws you know as a theoretical slogan it might be good but as soon as this political motto is practically applied then there appears the well-known assertion of lenin Dzerzhinsky and others which goes as socialistic legitimacy everyone who overstepped it was shot that was right if these laws have been set by people if a controlling mechanism has been created which controls the bureaucracy from lower levels then the power should be controlled by people the key problem of political system of socialism is putting the power under control of people it is not solved right away people can't become masters of the power right away if we manage to provide such control if the groups that are in power have less and less authorities and opposite to that if citizens that are organized in associations get more and more authorities we will proceed on our way to communism otherwise we will degenerate and finally come to the restoration of capitalism thank you for your attention speeches of seconds presenter we pass on to the third round i've got a question to mikhail vasilievich and to you alexander vladimirovich our plan runs as follows speeches of prearranged seconds three persons from each side have you got such people to whom you'd like to give you the floor to speak mikhail vasilievich popov yes i have presenter mikhail vasilievich please present your three men Mikhail Vasilievich Popov, Viktor Ivanovich Galko, candidate of economical sciences, rector of the University of Workers, correspondent of the Foundation of Academy of Workers. This is my first second. Yurkov Kirill Valerievich, candidate of technical sciences, professor of Red University of the Foundation of Academy of Workers, correspondent. And Ivan Mikhailovich Gerasimov, candidate of technical sciences, professor of Red University. Chief editor of Pravda Truda, Verity of Labor. Vice president of Foundation of Academy of Workers, correspondent. Presenter. So each one of you has five minutes. You are welcome. Alexander Vladimirovich Buzgalin, Tatiana Ivanovna, I found myself in quite a fix. The colleagues whom I asked to make a speech as my seconds have not fully agreed to fulfill this historical mission. Yosef Grigorievich Abramson has agreed, maybe Kirill will agree as well. Kirill, yes, I'm going to say a couple of words. Alexander Vladimirovich Buzgalin, so if Kirill has agreed, then maybe Evgeny Sanich will agree too. I thank you all presenter before we pass on to the third round our agenda prescribes a free discussion this discussion implies speeches from any of the audience each speaker will have three minutes Viktor Ivanovich Galko can we start presenter yes please you've got five minutes Viktor Ivanovich Galko Dear comrades, as far as I understand, our audience here consists of protagonists of Marxism, at least such are speakers from our side. To my knowledge, Marxism has got basic fundamental concepts due to which it can be characterized as Marxism. One of them is class nature of any state, Soviet state, bourgeois state. Therefore, any statements about some power of people which goes over class nature of state, such statements have nothing to do with Marxism. This is the first point. The second point is the following. Alexander Vladimirovich, while answering questions, has told that in the USSR communism had never been built. Also, he criticized the fundamental second concept of Marxism-Leninism, that is, the transitional period from capitalism to communism, the first phase of communism, it means socialism, and of the highest stage of communism, full communism. He told that this was just a casual allusion in some unknown work by Marx, Engels and Lenin. Nothing of this sort, this is fundamental concept, which characterizes that what has happened in the USSR. Therefore, this idea, which is expressed by Alexander Vladimirovich, can be described as an attempt of revision of one of the fundamental concepts of Marxism under the guise of its amplification. 
The third point, again, in the answer of Alexander Vladimirovich, it was told that during the certain period of the USSR, elements of any democracy, be it socialistic or bourgeois, were removed. Let me remind you, please, one of the key concepts of Marxism, which was mentioned by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who says that there can be either bourgeois dictatorship of proletari or proletarian dictatorship. There cannot be any third option. I will not quote this statement in full, otherwise I might be blamed for pinning labels. But all of you know that this saying is ending in a severe fashion stating that such people must be not let out to tribunes. Thank you for your attention. Presenter, thank you very much for saving our time. Yurkov is coming next, isn't he? Mikhail Vasilyevich Popov. Yes, Kirill Valerievich. Kirill Valerievich Yurkov. Dear comrades, when we are speaking about development in general and about development of Marxism in particular, we should first of all remember what development is, and this will be closely connected with attempts of using terms from mathematics such as linearity, nonlinearity, etc. Development, my dear comrades, is this movement from simple to complex, from lower to higher. If we remember dialectics, then any development includes two opposite momenta, progress and regress. Regress is a kind of movement which is opposite to the direction of progress, to general direction. Progress is when the movement coincides with movement in its development. Thus, dialectics offers us quite a nice category of description of what is going on in development of any society. Now, Alexander Vladimirovich proclaims the following, as if this nonlinearity, this diffuseness, some other terms had also been used, it has appeared just recently. I beg your pardon, but has development ever stopped for a tiny second? Wasn't there any development during bourgeois revolutions? There was no li non-linearity or linearity in any of those bourgeois revolutions, no matter how hard you try to find it there. Development is always contradictory, any movement and any development is contradictory. Then concerning guidance which we should find in Marxism, theoretical statements of Marxism that we should rely upon. We may remember that, in fact, we need to answer the question, what kind of epoch we are living in now? This needs to be done in order to understand how to develop Marxism, what statements are outdated and what statements need to be modified. If we speak about Marx, Marx investigated the epoch of free market. It means the capitalism of free competition. He has created research works of three volumes named The Capital, where he is making analysis of capitalism of free competition. After that, there came Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, and Vladimir Ilyich demonstrated, and you were right in making notice of it, that he criticized Marx in that sense, saying that the epoch has changed. Capitalism remained, but this capitalism is capitalism of monopolies. Monopolies are ruling today, they are basically represented by governmental monopolies. This imperialistic capitalism is moldering away, and this becomes the eve of socialistic revolutions. We entered the epoch of socialistic revolutions in 1917. I'd like to ask you, has this epoch changed? Are we living in some different epoch? Isn't it the epoch of socialistic revolutions? Has capitalism modified? Isn't it imperialistic today? Alexander Vladimirovich Buzgalin, do you think that nothing has changed during this century? Kirill Valerievich Yurkov, there are quite a lot of changes that have happened since the other day. Alexander Vladimirovich. Alexander Vladimirovich Buzgalin, no, I'm just reciting what you said. Kirill Valerievich Yurkov, there are quite a lot of things which have changed since the day before yesterday, and a lot of things changed just a minute ago. Therefore, one needs to answer this question in the following way. We are living in the epoch of socialistic revolutions. The theory of socialistic revolutions was described by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin in detail.
Well, dear comrades, Alexander Vladimirovich gave a comprehensive description of Trotsky's approach. As we all remember, Lenin in his letter to the Congress said about non-Bolshevism of Trotsky and that it was not his personal fault. Why so? In one of his latest works named Concerning the Importance of Belligerent Materialism, Lenin told that we all need to form a circle of lovers of Hegel's dialectics. Otherwise our materialism will not be belligerent, but it will be defeated. This message of Lenin was neglected by many followers of Marxism. Thus we can hear such things as opposition of democracy and dictatorship. Lenin called this contraposition to be vulgar. If we just take the definition of what dictatorship is, then we learn that it is power not limited by law. What is democracy from philosophical point of view? It is submission of minority to the interests of majority. Even from this point of view, even from the point of view of formal logic, these two definitions do not contradict each other. A democratic state in particular for the presence of representative bodies and constitution. There were not any such like in fascist governments. Reichstag was practically absent during Hitler's power. Mussolini had a big council to which he assigned members himself, etc. When did the first representative body appear? In the ancient Athens. Was there any democracy? Of course there was. They had a very democratic state, which is still actively studied in American universities. Because their democracy was, pardon me for a vulgar term, pure. It comprised representatives of democracy, it means slave owners. Some of them were richer, some of them were poorer, they had different value, of course, but all of them sponged on their slaves for a living. The democracy they had was spot clean, it was honest and without any fraud, but they lived on unrequited labor of their slaves. During feudalism, there too was class dictatorship instead of king's or tsar's dictatorship. If a king or a tsar opposed to the ruling majority, he was removed. Let's remember the history, for example, killing of Tsar Pavel III. Tsar could sing eulogium to himself. He could call himself Pantokrator of Russian land, but it was the ruling class that was Pantokrator of the land, not the Tsar himself. Concerning proletarian dictatorship, it is the most complicated of these terms because working class is called like that because it is working. It spends eight hours a day in front of working machine unit. Besides, eight hours of work a day is quite an outdated norm of working time. Marx made an ironical observation that only a horse can work eight hours a day for a pro prolonged time. It has been 100 years already that we have eight hours working day in Russia. But it is necessary that someone should perform power duties and then there appear some people, some special people who are allegedly working for the benefit of proletariat. Soon they get some interests that are separate from interests of proletariat and they use their position to fulfill them. There is nothing special in this scheme. People who stay true, who are tempered with clandestine struggle, people like Lenin, Stalin, Dzerzhinsky, Kirov, etc., such people are few. All others, when they get possibilities of serving their own interests, they seize this opportunity. This is quite a serious discrepancy in proletarian dictatorship. People tried their best to solve this problem. There used to be workers and peasants inspection, quite a powerful organization. There used to exist maximal fee for party members so that the party wouldn't attract money makers. Factories used to be supervised by workers. Finally, there used to be the Soviet power itself. Some people get outraged by the fact that there existed non-voters, but no one feels any indignation by the fact that under capitalism money makes the vote. We all know how much it costs to get elected to Duma, what the price is of getting elected to legislative assembly, etc. A voice from the audience. And how much does it cost? Ivan Mikhailovich Gerasimov, it definitely costs some fat sum. You will never get there without money. Clever and handsome as you are, there is no chance for you to succeed getting get there without money, I can assure you. 
A voice from the audience. I'm just interested to know how much did Tulkin pay? Mikhail Vasilich Popov, KP KPR. F paid for him. He was in the list of KPRF, otherwise he wouldn't get there. Ivan Mikhailovich Gerasimov. So this is the dictatorship of bourgeoisie, so to speak. Dictatorship of proletariat implies extraction of bourgeoisie from governing process and there is nothing scary in that. It is the same when we do not render freedom of speech to child molesters, perverts, killers, etc. Parasitic class is not needed at the first stage of communism. Presenter, thank you very much, Ivan Mikhailovich. Who's going to start the first? Iosif Grigorievich, you've got five minutes. I'm thankful to all the seconds as well to all the speakers. I'd like to say the following. Many words have been spoken about dictatorship. I agree that it makes no sense while correcting Marx. The essence of any state is dictatorship which defends interests of the ruling class quite enough has been spoken about it. When proletariat takes the power, its dictatorship is to defend interests of proletariat. What interests does proletariat have as a class? Its interest is getting rid of classes, stopping being a class removing all habits created by capitalism and pre-capitalistic mode of production, excluding bourgeoisie as all that was discussed here. Only after that it can be possible to become engaged in education, corporate responsibility, corporate action in order to become association where all are free because everyone is free. This is the main thing in the proletarian dictatorship, namely the removal of class structure, the main, the restoration of capitalism, at least preparation for this restoration, unfortunately started three, four years after Lenin's death, because not a single word about corporate responsibility was left then. Socialism is a phase of transition, the lowest phase, phase of transition from capitalism to communism, complete communism, society without classes. All societies that have classes can be represented as four-wheeled vehicle, say four-wheeled many or galley during slavery, a horse vehicle for feudal times, a good automobile for capitalistic class. The transitional phase, its symbol is an airplane. Or even a bicycle, which can't make a stop. If it stops, it falls down. We made a stop almost right away. It happened after Lenin and all his adepts passed away. Here was one of the mistakes of the party as political avant-garde of working class. This mistake was made at the 13th Congress. Lenin made a recommendation in his letter to this Congress. This recommendation was not fully quoted by my colleague of this roundtable discussion. The main thing in it was that Lenin recommended to replace Comrade Stalin from the position of the General Secretary. Then Lenin made characteristics of other comrades. This wasn't mentioned here, but this is the main point. All remaining months of his conscious life were dedicated to struggle with Stalin. The principle of autonomies. This principle was to kill the union of equal right republics. This is the main point. Not concerning proletariat. Proletariat is getting more complex. Alexander Vladimirovich described it quite well today. Proletariat becomes more complex. 
Bolsheviks found support in industrial working class. This was the chief avant-garde class of proletariat by 1917 and didn't remain like this until, say, the middle of the century. There gradually appeared new proletariat, which new class, which is connected with higher level of production means, productive forces. This is proletariat of higher technologies. Information, radiation, robotic technologies, this proletariat is different to industrial proletariat. It is different because it is not kept together, it is dispersed. It is more difficult to do propaganda work with it, but it is more ready to understand socialistic issues which are necessary for it to become a really struggling class. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Presenter. Thus, new proletariat ceases to be proletariat. No. If so, then let's get back to the subject. Kirill Evgenievich, please. Dear colleagues, I'd like to turn your attention to two circumstances. First, alleged pet term of proletarian dictatorship. This is important because we are not just doing scientific research of the ambience, but we are also fulfilling propaganda tasks. First, concerning dictatorship. It is obvious what associations this word rises in a common mind. Of course, as a term, this word has a right to exist. As a scientific definition, which most adequately describes the essence of the ultimate form of state. Now concerning proletariat, Mikhail Vasilievich, you are quite a well-known and big admirer of Stalin. How could you omit a very important circumstance which he analyzed in his speech before ratification of the Constitution in 1936, which he couldn't like, of course? But Stalin states quite clearly there that it is not correct to speak about proletariat at the stage of construction of socialism. If this is a class, which is a class of paupers, exploited class, the basic class of capitalistic society, then are we going in the right direction when we are talking about proletarian dictatorship during the stage of socialistic construction until communist social relationships are fully accepted? Is a class that is in power in this society, is it proletariat? A voice from the audience. It is owner of public property. Yes, you are totally right. It is owner of the public property, but this circumstance is more of a propaganda nature. Now concerning your idea, which you have been defending in your speeches, in printed and in video materials. This idea is about factory-based principle of Soviet power construction as a form of fulfillment of proletarian dictatorship. In 1918, when the first Soviet constitution was ratified, the rulers of the government, so to speak, described the working class as a cork floating in a bowl of berry drink, the berry drink of petty bourgeoisie in a peasant country. The situation remained in 1936, when all those class limitations which were inadequate to the epoch, when those limitations were changed. Election rights were rendered to everybody. I'm not defending the Constitution of 1936, this is not my point. I just want to say that Stalin acted quite logically when he said that and when he implemented that into practice. It became clear then that there remained no antagonistic classes in this society, the population of which consisted of workers and service workers who were loyal to Soviet power. The population of villages was united into collective farming, it was also loyal to the Soviet power. Keeping alive all those limitations that were called to be temporary by Lenin himself in 1918, this is just falling into the worst form of dogmatism.
In that sense, you, I beg your pardon, are just saying lies when you claim that after the ratification of the Constitution in 1936, deputies were never revoked. From 59 till 79, this is official statistics, more than 8,000 deputies of different levels were revoked, including 12 deputies of the Supreme Council. Of course, we may criticize the, the system for its formality, but the election of deputies into all institutes of Soviet power occurred via industrial working groups. Revoke was implemented via same route. Then why are you making forms which existed in 1918 and were adequate then? Why are you making them absolutely proper if they ceased to be like that by the moment of removal of bourgeois class? That is what I wanted to say. Presenter, thank you, Evgeny Alexandrovich. Well, I think that the majority of people who came here, there are young people among them, this majority shows how important, how relevant this topic is. One might say that during 30 years everything has been discussed concerning lessons of Soviet socialism. But today's discussion, which I find to be of higher level, it shows that there still remains a lot to be sorted out and to be studied. I'd like to make two basic notes here. Of course, this discussion is to be focused on the issue of proletarian dictatorship as a particular form of democracy. But this wasn't the point of the discussion. We have drifted to many basic truths of Marxism. I'd like to ask Mikhail Vasilievich. As far as I understand, you support the idea of home rule and the role of industrial cooperative groups. Don't you see that proletarian democracy can't exist within conditions of nationalization of economy? If so, then we need to formulate a problem. We would not turn to Marx only because Marx did not survive until October Revolution. Lenin was worried a lot with the problem of bureaucracy. He searched for various methods of coping with this main hazard, this main foe, and he, too, could not totally make it out. Therefore, it is our task, us trying during many years to clear out the so lessons of Soviet socialism. I would also like to dwell upon a few more moments here. More than once he repeated that dictatorship is power not limited with any law. Well, I'm not sure how to call it from methodological point of view, but it is not scientific approach. If Soviet law appeared, if then there appeared the Soviet constitution in 1918, was it democracy then? Did proletarian dictatorship end up? No, it continued. Some people were right when they said that Soviet legitimacy was what some people got shot for, for violation of the, that legitimacy. Therefore, the sense of dictatorship does not lie there. This is the point of the matter. The fact that many people, and unfortunately Mikhail Vasilyevich among them, are confusing item terms, essence of government and form of ruling. Form of ruling is a term of law. You told yourself that bourgeois ruling, bourgeois state can have different forms, fascist, etc. What about proletarian state? Doesn't it have any form? You are a supporter of Soviets. Didn't you see the historical examples of diminishing of Soviet democracy, including election system and everything else, diminishing and gradually fading away? If we do not pay attention to this, if we ignore this, then we will never answer the question where bureaucratic then bourgeois degeneration took its origin. We need to pose these questions. Of course, we shouldn't be adepts of bourgeois democracy. By the way, concerning the people who didn't have a right to vote. In twenties, there used to be a special committee and a person could apply to it. If one used to be a businessman and then you stopped making profit, he was got and could vote. This was not the main point, of course. The main point was that Lenin said that he, we couldn't expect any lady cook 
to rule the government. We need to teach every lady cook to involve her into these ongoings. Did these ongoings receive any further development in our country? Alexander Ivanovich, you, he too spoke of great importance of it. That's why we need to, first of all, to analyze the evolution of forms of power in 2030s, because, to my opinion, the proletarian dictatorship, which won in 1917, then turned into dictatorship of party. We didn't say anything about the party, still, this is an important issue. At the 12th 13th Congress it was declared sober-mindedly that we had party dictatorship. Then we had dictatorship of the leader who, with the support from apparatus of repressions, killed all his opponents, communists among them. So was this democracy proletarian or non-proletarian? I think it led us to the point where we find ourselves today. And the last but not least, we, as materialists, economists, should understand that the Constitution of 1936, about which I have been listening things, that the change of election principle, transition from industrial to territorial principle, well, one should be an idealist to think that only due to this article of the Constitution everything went sideways. There were more important issues that such a formal issue of the Constitution, important as it is. You make a slight movement, and Kirill was right here, you contradict even Stalin's ideas. You make a shrewd move to turn away from the more serious questions which concern the generation of proletarian dictatorship, which was born by 1917. Presenter. Dear colleagues, we've got 21 minutes for speeches of seven persons. Maybe seven persons is too many a number, and we will get along with six people, or we will need to reduce the time up to two minutes and a half. A voice from the audience. Let younger generations speak. Presenter, I think we will set the time limit of three minutes if speakers manage to state their point. So, Anatoly Alexeyevich, you are not going to be the first. Let younger generation speak. Please introduce yourself. Kuchuk Vladimir Alexandrovich, programmist, 37 years old, probably young. Dear comrades, concerning the question which was raised in the beginning in f of the speech by Alexander Vladimirovich concerning the development of Marxism, that 150 years have passed. Development is going on. It never stops. We need to study new best practices and apply them to new conditions. Dear comrades, this is mutilation of the capital when people say that a modern scientist produces more value than industrial worker at a factory. This is not development of Marxism. This is dismantling of it right from the start. saying that this means just taking an idealistic position, brushing away objective economic laws and economic interests of the society too. Then it is no wonder if someone says that we've got a creative class in which, which is playing the part of a leading class. The proofs that we have heard in the report, such as that capitalism in Europe is social, we all know pretty well that it has been a long time since the capitalism has become global and when in a capitalistic country life is prosperous, that means that in other countries living is bad. Not because these countries are not well developed yet, but because when we are not hiding real contradiction, 
contradiction behind such classification, then we understand that well-developed countries are enjoying life at the cost of countries which are called developing. In reality, these countries are degrading and are being exploited. Russia is among them. Scandinavian so-called socialism is based on that Scandinavian capital is participating in, in exploitation of Russian workers. They are making excess profit. This is clear from the structure of capital of our biggest monopolies. When considering them not separately but within context of the global market, we will see that 30-40% of the biggest banks in our country belong to foreign capital. Monopolies are just over-exploiting the working class. If we keep on talking about creative classes that are in fact not main classes because they are not engaged in material production, then we will get lost in these illusions. Wishing to make improvement, we will not improve anything. We will just brush Marxism away and take the side of allies of capitalism. Thank you for your attention. Presenter. Next speaker should also belong to the younger generation. Let it be you. Please, introduce yourself. G. V. Bobinov. Bobinov Gregory, a doctor. Being a doctor, I am concerned about exhumation issues. You have told us that Yazov shot people in large numbers. How large was that number, would you tell us? Please, Alexander Vladimirovich. A voice from the audience, 8,000 a day. So these should be millions? I am ready to take a spade and go and try to find them. A voice from the audience, 800,000 total. Where are these 800,000 buried? I am ready to come with a spade. I think. This historical period is ill-used so that some people could freely say that millions of people were killed etc. One needs to study documents to prove it. Many of these documents are still kept in secret. If we are not able to study these materials, we can't judge the role of Stalin, the role of Yezov or the role Khrushchev played in those years. A voice from the audience, relatives of people who had been repressed, Raise up your hands. Four persons raised their hands. What I am saying is that at present the archives are not fully accessible. We can't estimate the historical impact our leaders have made, namely the role of Stalin until these archives and all cases are open for research. Speaking about 1937 it was told here that people were killed in huge numbers. These huge numbers usually mean millions. I am against that. <laughs> Presenter, David Birkovich, did you want to add something? You see, it is not easy to say that I have discerned two points of view in these many speeches, not just speeches of two basic opponents. One point of view is, I beg your pardon, similar to that children have at the fourth year of school. The second one is equal to that of a university student. When people say that democracy is just subjugation of minority to majority, then we need to consider the problems which the proletarian dictatorship faced, namely the first socialistic state that was still in progress, and you will not settle these issues. In order to understand what is what one needs to know that dictatorship is provided by a class. Party is head of the class, party is led, as Lenin used to say, by a thin layer of Bolsheviks, and these Bolsheviks are led by a several leaders, so who is fulfilling the proletarian dictatorship? 
Is it proletariat itself? Proletariat is working surrounded by its machinery, or it is used as army at civil war. The proletarian dictatorship is fulfilled by a thin layer of people who have pretty little to do with proletariat. They act as if they are protecting the interests of proletariat, it is done until certain moment. But no one can guarantee this for long. It is just a small group, as Rosa Luxemburg said in 1918. Who is leading? Is there any proletarian dictatorship? A little group of people are leading there. Isn't it true? Under conditions of civil war it was true. There was no proletarian dictatorship, to be honest with you. If we understand dictatorship as the power that protects the interests of the majority, then is it possible for the majority of workers to influence the politics of the upper layers of power, that is what Booz Galen was talking about. Not in a formal way, as just changing representatives once in five years according to the Constitution of 1936 or more often, according to the Constitution of 1918. But controlling, checking the power, changing representatives when it is needed, making them meet their responsibilities. Was there any period like that in our history? Civil war did not let do that. It was impossible to let any level of democracy during the time of severe civil war. Soviet power would have been smashed if it had let it be so. If you read shorthand notes of congresses, not textbooks written during particular periods of our history, then you will see that, Booz Galen quoted that partially, out of 500 of people at the 11th Congress only 240 call themselves to be out of workers, people just from the factory were absent there. In 1939, at the 18th Congress, the question of social origin was not even dwelt upon. The new generation of nomenclature made 75% of participants. These were officials of regional, administrative and upper power institutions. Where, to the devil, was proletarian dictatorship there? Just what are you talking about? You have not even got the idea, with your fourth school year level. Please just read a bit from what there was in reality, not just books by classics. Classics were the first negation of capitalism. 100, 150 years have passed since. Now we need negation of negation, we need to study the experience of new economic policy where private property was allowed. Mikhail Popov said that we need to shoot those who allow private property. That means that Lenin was to be shot. He was, so to speak, prone to be killed. Presenter Please, introduce yourself. My name is Alexander Bogdanov. I'd like to ask the people who are, so to speak, defending Marxism and Socialism in this dispute. I ask you, please, come back to the tasks of today's moment. Our country is facing the risk of beginning a war, war with Russia. What for? Because it is motherland of communism. The war with Russia because when in 1991 the USSR was divided according to borders set by communists, not ethnical borders, 15 to 25 million of Russian people were left in separate ethnocracies. Dear Marxist comrades, has any one of you stated honestly that the hangover of communism is expressed as breaking into 15 ethnocracies, not democracies, where Russian people are forced to mess about, surrounded by international sanctions? Who's going to guarantee equal rights of Russian people in those ethnocracies if communists keep on discussing class issues? I'm telling you, Russian people are suffering for not being Russian but for the fact that Russia is motherland of communism. We will be diminished and destroyed in revenge for communism. 
Therefore, I am asking you to concentrate upon the tasks of the country, on tasks of people, because the greatest legacy of mankind which we've got is the communistic Soviet culture, which has been created in Soviet period. Nothing compares to the ideal of a human being and human relationships that have been created in works of art of Soviet period. This legacy is going to be destroyed soon, so that people had nothing to compare it with. That's what I wanted to say. You say right away, stop that, according to the stupid habit of yours. Please reject these habits. Come out to discuss the most painful issues of the present day and solve them openly and honestly without your foolish class approaches because it is obvious that proletariat will never rule any communist state. Presenter, please introduce yourself. Next speaker. I am Anton Suchkov, member of Party of Workers of Russia since recently. It has been a short time since I began to study these issues. They are quite new for me. I'd like to say a pair of words in support of Mikhail Vasilyevich, who created this interesting platform, the Red University, which is open for everybody. I, for example, used to have no idea. I had superficial knowledge. I came to study in the Red University. Fundamental knowledge is given in logical order there. This platform is open for everybody. Our country is in state of chaos because people do not understand elementary things like class structure of society and other notions. I think this is a very important work which is being done by the Party of Workers of Russia and the Red University and the Red University of Workers Correspondents. It is quite useful. Of course, it is not easy to come to correct answers. One needs to study, study and once more to study, as Vladimir Ilyich Lenin used to say. I call upon all of you to study this issue and then have a discussion. It will become possible to find truth via argument. Presenter, a minute and a half for you, no more, please. Speaker, all right, dear comrades, we've got no simple choices for you. The matter is that the current epoch has been continuing for more than a hundred years. It is quite continuous, this transition from capitalism to socialism. During last 30-40 years we find ourselves in transition backwards, from socialism to capitalism. Why that happened, we have been clearing out for many years. A voice from the audience. This has already been explained by Mikhail Vasilievich. It seems to me that he hasn't not explained that yet. This is the most interesting point, because if you remember the year of 1991, this was the time when Soviet factory workers, in total silence from peasants and with much support from intellectuals, claimed slogans like freedom and commodities. They didn't claim any power. This was happening then. People of elder generation should remember that quite well. Now this is changing. This political conjuncture, we need to understand why exactly we came up to this. Many things have been said here, but this passage from socialism to capitalism is really quite a long one. The term proletarian dictatorship is quite controversial itself. This is quite important, and no one paid any attention to that today, because proletariat is the lowest class, and when lowest classes become upper classes and implement dictatorship, this is something new. This never happened in reality. What we have observed during the last century, this was the development of this process, the turning of proletariat into the ruling class with its simultaneous self-destroying. We can't understand this either because communism means society without classes. If it appears gradually, we should have observed gradual merge and disappearing of former classes. Presenter, the only thing which I'd like to add 
is that historical conscience of man is evolving slower than the productive forces are evolving. Those new conditions which were created by the Soviet power 70 years were not enough. Just look how much we managed to achieve in ideological, in spiritual sense. Just watch our achievements during those 15 years before the Great Patriotic War. All those achievements allowed us to win the war. But 70 years which were endowed to us were not enough for us to recognize ourselves as people who are able to live in communism. Now the last round. Final round. Presenter. Mikhail Vasilyevich, you are beginning. You've got 10 minutes. Alexander Vladimirovich is following you. Popov Mikhail Vasilyevich, the issue we've been discussing has gradually drifted to one side, to the issue of bureaucracy. Some comrades, Alexander Vladimirovich among them, formulate it a bit differently. This was how Trotsky had formulated this problem. He said that there existed the so-called bureaucratic class and that bureaucracy killed socialism. You will not find anything of the kind in Lenin's works. In Lenin's works you will find the issue of fighting against bureaucracy. This issue, fighting with bureaucracy, created basic contents of Lenin's book State and Revolution. Concerning the necessity of our discussion of development, all those contradictions which I have mentioned, they all are resolved by moving forward along the line of development of communism, not along the line of its degradation. This is implemented using the system of governmental planning centralized management. The system is inwardly controversial, no matter how much we speak that bureaucracy is bad, that narrow institutional interests are bad. This controversy, which we've mentioned, like what kind of proletarians are they, who's come to the Congress, who's been elected, etc., all this controversy between socialistic nature of the system of governmental planning and management with elements of place-hunting, bureaucracy, narrow institutional interests. Not to plunge into listing all of them, ultimately that means petty bourgeois deviation from proletarian streamline. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, but it matters what I get out of it. This is petty bourgeois mind, petty bourgeois mentality in administrative sphere. What recipes were offered by Lenin and how were they implemented? The first recipe is setting of the maximum salary for Communist Party members. Setting of maximum salary for Communist Party members means that officials should get wages that equal the sum of the wages of a middle worker. Then place hunters will not strive for membership in the Communist Party, because if party is infected, then the proletarian dictatorship will gradually pe perish. That is the first recipe. The second condition stipulated by Lenin, no money should be collected for hospitality expenditures. This is a common practice now. People demand money for presents, for catering, etc. No such expenditures should be made. And the most important point is what is what was included into the program. This was transition to six-hour working day with compulsory two hours of practical studies of professional military art and techniques of state management. In the State and Revolution, Lenin formulated his general motto, so to speak, which hasn't been quoted by today's fighters against bureaucracy. This motto declared that everyone should get used to being a bureaucratic worker for a while so that no one would be able to become a bureaucratic person. The main mistake here was that working day hasn't been shortened enough. It was thought that we need more steel, more iron, more bread. But what about free time? Free time means time spent for free, full development of human personality. Getting over division of labor, which still lingers within socialism, which is, this is the task of the class struggle of working class, getting over division of labor. This is priority task. But it is not like getting over defects and shortcomings. Only then we go can go further. 
We should go further and in this struggle we need to overcome all those negative characteristics which are not flattering for workers and representatives of other different classes and layers. This is the streamline and what is the most important thing there. The main thing is participation in the governmental management. Soviets could provide such management. Soviets that were elected in working groups and that allowed to revoke any candidate. When could that be done? At any moment. For example, if a deputy went sideways, no one punishes him, no one creates any scandal. This deputy is just revoked and swapped. For example, there are four persons from Kirov factory in the city Soviet. Then they can be replaced by four other persons or two people stay and two new persons come. That's it. And the main thing is that a representative should quit the Congress, the Soviet, if he, he was revoked by a group of factory workers. Nobody, no working groups could revoke representatives. Only those who voted for representatives could revoke them. Elective bodies consisted of population dwelling in territorial regions, not workers of factories or of plants. A voice from the audience. Only one candidate for the whole territorial region. So, workers were blessed with the possibility of proposing a candidate, but electors were completely other people. Elections were based on another principle. Therefore, revoking was impossible. The two-step system proposed by Lenin, which provided what Lenin called organizational structure of proletarian dictatorship, it was swapped by system when, so to speak, a million voters elected one deputy. Who could revoke him? Organizational department of the Central Committee or organizational department of Regional Committee? Our further bureaucracy thrived in such conditions. A remark from Bogdanov. The Congress of People's Deputies of the USSR revoked itself. The so-called Congress of People's Deputies of the USSR was no true Congress of People's Deputies, Comrade Bogdanov. I remember you quite well. We were standing together at Sadova. You sold anti-Soviet issues of Pravda newspaper and now you are saying what a pity. You issued that paper, you sold it, and now you are saying what a pity that we lost communism. This happened because of you among all others. I just explained to you that I promulgated communism and you promulgated anti-Sovietism. Comrade Bogdanov, you haven't been called upon to speak. Presenter to Bogdanov. Dear colleague, please quit this hall. The reason being that you interfere with our work. One more time, you are hindering our work. Popov Mikhail Vasilyevich, so I'd like to point out some mistakes that have been made here. It was said that Stalin proclaimed party dictatorship. This is untrue. It was Zinoviev who proclaimed party dictatorship. Please read the shorthand notes of the meetings. A voice from the audience. I didn't say that it was Stalin. So who did it? Zinoviev. Stalin made a speech and criticized him for that. This proclamation about dictatorship of the party was noted down as anti-party and anti-Soviet. The sense of proletarian dictatorship wasn't in having proletariat to serve the party, vice versa, having the party to serve the proletariat. This is the first point. The second mistake protruding here is that people take the word dictatorship separately from the word proletariat. Please read the work Great Beginning, where Lenin is saying that it is a special term, a scientific, historical and philosophical term, proletarian dictatorship. This term can't be divided into two pieces. It can't be dissected. Proletarian dictatorship doesn't mean that proletariat will be a tyrant. This term means that during the socialistic phase proletariat is to supervise the development until total disappearing of classes. It is said straightforward that working class of cities, factories and 
plants is to lead masses of the working and the exploited until classes are fully wiped out. Another moment stated by Comrade Kozlov was that working groups should control their property. Lenin declared that the greatest distortion of basics of Soviet power and total negation of socialism is any direct or implicit legalization of property of production by workers of a separate factory. This means anti-Marxism. This is struggle with public property which keeps on going even when there is no public property. Presenter, thank you very much, Mikhail Vasilievich. Your speech has taken 10 minutes sharp. Dear colleagues, I'm afraid I'm going to be sharp. The first point. Unfortunately, the bulk of critics against my position and the position of my colleagues, it reduced just to Lenin said so and so, and all that you, you are saying, Alexander Vladimirovich, is not what Lenin said. Nothing else. My attitude to Marx and to Lenin is highly respectful. Please believe me, if we start emulating each other in quoting, I can oppose many other quotes from Marx and from Lenin, but this is not going to prove anything. Proof means analysis of historical process, it's more than outcomes and results. When we are just keeping on quoting old citations, and I haven't heard anything else today, old citations taken from books written in 1960s, 1970s or any other past years, books about socialistic planning, good books and articles written by you, Mikhail Vasilievich, then it starts being quite boring. It's no use working like that. This is the first point. The second point is there that there hasn't been proposed any step, any practical proposition how to involve working class, how to turn it into not a class, not into a non-class unit of working people during construction of socialism and communism how to involve them into management of the process of production, of governmental management, of control over politics, culture at all levels. No steps were proposed there except for all that it should be written in the Constitution that representatives should be elected on the basis of factory working groups. Dear colleagues, imperative mandate is a good thing. We have repeated it a dozen times, but one can put his boots on the oven, but that will not make them biscuits. Many wonderful things have been formulated on paper in all constitutions. Real living in the USSR was substantially different. Even people from the current audience know this, not speaking of anyone else. Let's make real analysis of these contradictions. When Mikhail Vasilievich was speaking about the fight against bureaucracy, he forgot just a trifle. Should everyone be changed for anyone? He also forgot many other trifles. Full development of all forms of formal bourgeois democracy. Lenin has left loads of quotes concerning that the proletariat that won the battle will need these forms of formal bourgeois democracy much more than any others. Freedom of speech, freedom of meetings, freedom of rallies. He said that bourgeoisie can't provide all those things, but we will need to procure them. Please read his polemics with Kautsky. This is my first point. The second point. Criticizing slavery democracy, bourgeois democracy and any other democracy should be possible and more than that it is absolutely necessary to do that in our lectures. Busgalin is absolutely with you here. He has written a lot about how this is made via manipulative technologies today. Let's not force into the open door. The theme of our dispute is different. It is about whether you consider it necessary to keep active struggle for developing of democracy from forms inside the bourgeois system or not. Are you going to keep silent concerning this issue? You are keeping silent. This contradicts Lenin, it contradicts Marx and the most important, it contradicts the struggle for liberation of working class. The third point, I'm just trying to choose the most essential points. What is it all for? This is all for the communism and we are all united here. The definition of communism has also been a bit vague here. 
If we place the th free manifold development of a human free will association that is acting as uncoerced and working, we all are moving towards free will uncoerced working association, then this communistic challenge demands adequate political forms, starting with the struggle for social freedom within capitalism and continuing this struggle after the victory of revolution during the phase of transition, so to speak, and during the first phase of communism. The struggle for a free, working, free will association. All these principles should be fully developed for the human interests, not for anything else. Let us place it as exclamation mark. We need to subject the class struggle to that. The fourth point, today's state of the world. This young man has told with revolutionary verve, this is the epoch of imperialistic struggle and the epoch of socialistic revolutions. Do you agree with that? I agree, dear young man. More than that, we are still living in the epoch of capitalism, we are living in the realm of necessity, and we also live in somewhat Jurassic period, and all that is true. The point is that a century has passed since those times when Lenin wrote about imperialism. Capitalism has become more cruel, more complicated and more contradictory. There have appeared new forms of market, money, capitalism, exploitation, relations between the center and periphery, new social structure. Today Lenin's works are needed but only as a first step, they are not enough to further on. They are not enough because the social structure has considerably changed and social basis of the left has changed. I have told that industrial proletariat is the most numerous and that is true for the world. But in the 19th century, when Marx was writing about the class of industrial workers, it was just a thin layer of the class of working people worldwide. Just a tiny piece in several parts of the world. Why did he say that industrial proletariat was the future? Because it used to be the avant-garde class. Today, the avant-garde class is the class which is creating cultural artifacts that help solve problems of material production. This young man has blamed me for anti-materialism. My dear colleague, a well-written program lets enhance the productivity of a plant for 10-15% by making up for 100 workers of productive sector, if there are 1,000 people of the staff of the plant. This is made possible by one programmer, if he makes a good management program. A dozen of engineers and specialists who breed a new plant variety Let's decrease the number of agricultural workers who plow the earth and raise the crop by 10%. They economize labor of hundreds, thousands, millions of people. Such is the practice of China, where people understand that quite well. Creative class isn't football player, neither loafers nor journalists. Creative class are teachers who raise the main productive force of the society and best human qualities, ability to, for creative work and for common work. All this is made by teachers, doctors, workers of museums and librarians. And this is true. This is Marx. If you read about the global labor, which makes the basis of communism, you will understand that I am following the spirit and the letter of this outstanding and great scientist. The key problem which is political in this case, this is my sixth point, the problem of submission of bureaucracy to the working class. Praise God, we have reached this topic in the end of our discussion. The matter is that the main task of proletarian dictatorship is namely this task. The reason why I told that this term isn't convenient to use, we can meditate upon that form from formal logic point of view, the dictatorship and the democracy coincide, but we are living in the world where people know quite well what dictatorship means. They know it by the example of dozens of countries where people are being destroyed in large masses. Fascist dictatorship was in Chile and in many other places. By the way, there are official data which are unsealed now 
data from secret archives of Soviet security forces. According to these data, many hundreds of thousands of people had been repressed. Please watch the official statistics, okay? These data are not over-exaggerated at all. A call from the audience. Shall we do that together with Bandera followers? No, not with Bandera followers. New re numerous remarks from the audience. This is the general number of those who were just fined and those who had capital punishment put together. Dear colleagues, all right, I will make just a little reminiscence here. In Dzerzhinsky's and in Lenin's period, right after the end of the Civil War, according to these official data, there had been repressed with all those half-fascist nationalists invaders about 100 times less people than in Stalin's period. According to official data of Soviet security organs, there have been repressed 100 times less people in the most difficult moment for the Soviet power. And this also was general number, those who were just lightly punished and those who had capital punishment. So, let's move further. How shall we fight against those bureaucratic people, nomenclature, who, those who, in the name of the people, and for a certain period that was used to be really so, for the good of the people, they usurped the power in our country? This is the key problem. This question has to be posed. If we keep ignoring it, we are going to sink again. We will again look for a kind leader. This is the key difference. A huge, complicated, torturous difference between two Marxists who are fighting against each other but who should be doing the common task. This difference is that the task is either to upraise the people to self-organization or to believe in a kind Tsar. Believe in a new Stalin or someone else. This is the problem. When we start praising some or another leader, be it any leader, our mind gets shaped so that we start thinking, let our current president be, because he's a leader. He's saving our country. Our country should be united and we ourselves can do nothing. When Mikhail Vasilyevich says that we will break free by our own hands, then we need industrial self-management. We need powerful trade unions. We need to unite to go first to protestations, then to strikes. When we create our own class together, when this class controls the party and the nomenclature itself, because it is not important who said this, in Zinoviev or Stalin, the matter is that in the name of the class and even of the party, there ruled a very limited group. This group finally led the country to crash. This is where the tragedy is. This group was supported by bourgeois mentality of people who desired to enjoy paternalistic benefits. This is the tragedy of our country. In the future, the task of the working class is to overcome its class being. This has been told today and this is absolutely true. The working class needs to get rid of class nature. Marx understands quite well that the working class has two traits. One of them is solidarity, communization and struggle for communism. And another trait is what Gorky called miser's kopeck. It's will to sell the workforce as high as possible. This is inheritance of the working class as this class owns this value and wants to sell it at the market. This trade is to be taken away and this class will be turned into class of owners, organizers, creators who act according to principles of self-organization. This is the task of the state. By the way, the state should fade away. This is ABCs of Lenin and it hasn't been quoted today. Do you agree that the state is to die away? It is to do so via development of corporate action organs which have no political forms. Speaking in modern terms, this is to be done via civil society. It can't die away in any other ma manner. The last point will be concerning the tasks of today. We need to answer the question number one. 
Shall we set forward slogans and fight for full implementation of formal characteristics and principles of bourgeois democracy, which means availability of many parties, real freedom of speech, real possibility of collecting meetings, rallies, etc., access to mass media? These are all slogans of formal democracy. Banning of capital and money from participating in polls, this is a formal slogan of bourgeois democracy. Please don't shake your head, all these problems are real. People fight for that in India, in Brazil, in Scandinavia. By the way, speaking about Scandinavia, just a little note so that you colleagues couldn't understand what Scandinavian capitalism is about. If we accept the same model of distribution as in Sweden, under the same GDP as we have got now, our minimal salary will be two times bigger, middle salary will be one and a half times bigger, and there will be five times less oligarchs. Just a model which is similar to Scandinavian will do that, nothing else. This is what socialization of capitalism is about. Yes, you can play with terms, but it is an accepted term. Enhancement of the role of society, diminishing of role of capital, decrease of role of bureaucracy. This is what socialization is. Inside capitalism, since Lenin's times, there have been evolving socialistic traits. Please read the works about imperialism. Trusts give planning economy and this is the way to socialism, but this is working today for whom? For bourgeoisie. Don't you think that graduated income tax is a step towards socialism? Do we need to take this step or not? Let's talk practically. Higher education at the cost of graduated income tax. Free higher education. It is a step towards socialism or is it not? This is still capitalism, but this capitalism is different. Under this capitalism, workers would have a right to control the production, which is in Germany today. Veto power for dismissal of trade union leaders. Do we need that or not? It is just a senseless chatting demagogy, rejecting revolution from our side. Or is it you who are just chatting, practicing demagogy, rejecting revolution and refusal to do real work in order to prepare the revolution? The next step needs to be self-organization of people. We look in the same direction here. This is just what we need today. But not only trade unions should have that. Today's social movements in education, in research, etc. They do more than industrial workers. We need to get together here. I will not argue with you. We agree in this point. And the last thing which I'd like to say, dear friends, you should understand that all these discrepancies between us are quite important. But when we go to some manifestation, we will be in the same column and we will be cudgeled together if needed. In 1993, we were all attacked. So these disputes which are between us, they are quite important. Such kind of disputes lead to that after the victory, there start inner arguments, capital punishments, repressions, etc. So today we need to see clearly where we agree and in what extent. We need to act together and tr try leading open discussions. I would like to remind you that we initiated this discussion, not you, right? I mean the place of work. The reason is simple. You've got a ready truth, you own it and you need no one else. But we need you, because it is not good without you. It is better with you, because there is a vast space of culture within you. We can't turn away from that. We should work together. You also need us, because in other case you will remain outdated and you will never awaken from that state without polemics with us. I beg your pardon, but without these polemics you will never get awake. Presenter, dear colleagues, we've managed to keep up to the schedule. All participants and all organizers of the current meeting are thanking our audience. They invite you to think about another interesting topic for discussion, which will take place as soon as it is prepared. 
Afterward, Mikhail Vasilievich Popov. Summing up the discussion which we have just with Alexander Vladimirovich Busgalin, I should say that our opponents have demonstrated the usage of Marxist terms. They swear by Marx, they say Marxism is quite important, quite needful, etc. At the same time, they say that much time has passed and this time has erased the key statements of Marxism and that now we observe the so-called creative class instead of the working class. We forget here what makes the basis of the working class and what is the basis of the working class and the basis of proletarian dictatorship and the basis of socialism. Therefore, this discussion shows once more that moving forward can be possible only when we find support in the works of genius of, other, of our great teachers, Marx, Engels, Lenin, materialistic dialectics. All contemporary events should be considered taking into account these brilliant works and on the basis of them. Also, we should see that our society has moved back in many ways. When it goes back, old mistakes return in new look, old revisionist and opportunistic views are appearing as if a new word of in Marxist science. This means that we are going to have a long period of acute struggle with revisionism and opportunism, which are disguised in Marxist attire. Ivan Mikhailovich Gerasimov, it is quite good that this discussion has taken place. It is quite illustrative. What has it demonstrated? It has demonstrated the truth of well-known words by Lenin, that people remain foolish victims of fraud until they learn to see class interests behind the words of political figures. What interests have our opponents expressed today? interests of bourgeoisie, interests of bourgeois intellectuals. This is the reason why they fully ignore the interests of working class. They had nothing to say about how the state of the working class can be improved, what has to be done so that the working class could really rule the society and participate in state management. Nothing was said about the reduction of working day. Some negative things were said about flint skin in skinning of workers and as if it is the essence of economical struggle for defending interests of workers. Our working class is living from hand to mouth. It is degrading and it is seeing no perspectives. But our opponents have invented a new kind of proletariat so-called cognitariat. Intellectuals have always been available. So it makes it possible to say that it was the architect Montferran, for not workers, who built the Isakievsky Cathedral. Had there been no Montferran, the Isakievsky Cathedral would never have been built. That's clear now. This all is keeping on going, all these distortions of Marxism. They all lead to one thesis, that we should fight for bourgeois democracy, we need to fight for a better living within capitalism to get some liberties, rights, etc. The issues of worker class coming into power, question of struggle workers are unfortunately of no interest to our opponents. This is a great problem of communist movement in Russia, because the so-called lefts have take no interest in struggle of working class. They don't organize any struggle of working class.